this leader, the volume voice are of the same intensity and quality as the soundtrack which follows. Slides at the delivery desk for you. They're oh, on your table. Nice of you, thanks. Cytology, the science of cells. The science of cells, those minute living parts of which we are all made. How many cells in the body of Betty Robbins? Ten million? A billion? A hundred billion? Even more? Trillions? What can they tell us, these fixed, brightly stained particles that were only a few hours ago living cells in a living body? To the knowing eye, they tell a story. A story of health. What meaning is there in these distorted cells? To the knowing eye, they signify disease. So many answers these minute cells hold for us. So many questions they raise. And that of disease is only one of the questions. Working quietly in our research centers are the scientists who are slowly, carefully, sorting out the unanswered questions. One studies the behavior of the primitive one-celled animal. Another man watches as one cell becomes two, using photography to speed up the growth hundreds of times. Edges wave in response to what stimulus? Another studies cells from the retina of the human eye kept alive and growing outside the body. Why? What is the cause? How do they differ from the normal? How can we stop them? For each question, a hundred eyes peering down the barrels of a hundred microscopes, watching, searching, prying into the mysteries of the cell. Here is a human cell, the fundamental unit of all life, the dark spot is the nucleus, and surrounding it, the complex substance called cytoplasm. The thin outer membrane allows food, fluids, and waste to pass in and out. In the one-celled animal, the single cell performs all the functions necessary for life. It moves, it takes in food, digests it, and eliminates it. It has a rudimentary sense that allows it to find food or withdraw from danger. It reproduces by division. Efficient, but simple. In the highly organized trillion-celled human body, however, cells have many specialized functions, and often specialized shapes to accomplish the function. The long muscle cell has the power to contract and relax.
A nerve cell in a finger pricked by a needle flashes its warning message along a special fiber at the speed of a bullet. The monocyte floating in the bloodstream can change its shape, squeeze through narrow spaces to devour bacteria and other harmful substances. Cells in the glands manufacture substances that regulate a person's growth, digest his food, prepare his body to do battle. Goblet cells of the mucous membrane manufacture fluids, for instance, to protect the delicate air passages leading to the lungs. Other cells are equipped with hair-like cilia that constantly work to brush out dust breathed in with the air. The whole a trillion-celled mechanism, wonderful and incredible. And how do cells grow? That, too, we know something about. Consider, for instance, the cells lining a bronchial tube leading to a lung. It is the cells down at the deeper levels that have the ability to divide and become two cells. This orderly division occurs only as new cells are needed. The cells of the surface layer finally are dislodged and the lower cells shift up to fill the gap. We call this dislodging exfoliation. After the cells exfoliate, they are carried away in the mucus by the cilia. And down where growth occurs, a cell divides to make another cell which in its turn will grow to the surface and perform its function. For years, the millions of cells lining the bronchial tubes and cells in other parts of the body grow in this regular pattern. And then, for reasons that we do not yet understand, this pattern of cell growth changes in some people. Cell division becomes rapid, chaotic, growing out of normal bounds. These disorganized cells fail to perform the function of normal cells. This is cancer. One of the dangers in cancer is metastasis, in which cells from the first diseased area may find their way to other parts of the body. The two most frequent pathways by which cancer can spread are the blood vessels and the lymphatic system. Malignant cells may actually enter either of these channels and be carried along in the fluid. They lodge in some other place or even a number of places in the body. Wherever one of these unruly cells can get a foothold, the cancer can start in a new location. As we have not yet learned how to check this growth, our defense is to discover it before it grows out of bounds. How to do this? Therein lies the rest of our story. The cancer cells at the surface exfoliate just as normal cells do. One of the ways of discovering whether there is cancer is to take a sample of fluid in which cells are found and look for abnormal cells under a microscope. The pioneer in this method of detecting cancer is another one of our leading American scientists who is working on some of the unanswered questions. Dr. Papanicolo. It's little more than 10 years ago that he and his associates introduced the new technique to the medical profession. Today, this search for cancer cells is a standard laboratory procedure. And this is the person who searches, a cytotechnologist. Hi, Dave. Come take a look. What is it, from the cervix? No, it's bronchial. See those cells with the large nuclei? Uh-huh. Cancer? Certainly looks like it to me. I'll be surprised if Dr. Baker doesn't think so, too. Here's another one. This one's from the cervix. So many different shapes to recognize. Normal, normal, and this, abnormal. 
And on another slide, among the normal cells, a dark clump. Abnormal. It's a challenging job that the cytotechnologist has. A challenge to the skill of the eye and to an understanding of different kinds of cells. The problem is so great because the shapes of cells in different parts of the body are so varied. It's not only cells of the bronchial tubes and of the cervix that the cytotechnologist must be able to identify. There are a number of other places in the body where fluids containing exfoliated cells can be taken for examination. Among other places, specimens can be taken from the lungs, the stomach, the bladder, the body cavities, the breast. Examination of material from the female reproductive organs, however, has been the most useful by far. For one thing, it is one of the locations in which cancer most frequently has its beginnings. For another, a specimen can be taken easily, which is not true of many of the other areas. Well, no, it isn't, Mrs. Morris. You seem to be in fine shape. This is just a cell examination for cancer. Something I like to do as part of a periodic health examination for women of your age. Just a precaution? That's right. We'll get a report from the pathologist and on this and the other laboratory examinations, and we'll make an appointment to see you uh, towards the end of the week. One woman, one examination. And what if we could process thousands, tens of thousands of slides? Large-scale experiments have shown that perhaps as many as five out of every thousand examinations will expose an unsuspected cancer of the cervix. Each year, doctors over the country request this examination for more and more persons, more cytotechnologists. Edna Morse. The slides are recorded and identified. Betty will process many dozens, even hundreds of slides before finding one doubtful one. But that one slide is more than just a number on a chart. It represents a person's life that may be in danger. Before the cells on these slides can be studied under the microscope, they must be stained in order to define the various parts more clearly. When Betty receives the slides, they have been fixed and dehydrated in a solution of alcohol and ether. To accept the stain, their water content must be restored by a short series of baths and rinses. They are then ready for the first dye, a purplish chemical called hematoxylin. This stains only the nuclei. After the first dye, more rinses, then into an orange dye that stains the cytoplasm of certain kinds of cells. Other kinds of cells take up the greenish dye at the end. The rest of the jars are for rinsing the slides between dyes. The process isn't particularly complicated. It just has to be done in the right order and with precise timing so the cells won't take up too little or too much stain. After staining, a drop of mounting fluid is put on each slide and a cover glass put over the cells. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Baker. Are you processing slides for Dr. Wexler today? Uh, yes, there are two requests that came through this morning. May I see it, please? the pathologist. This is the man who directs the cytotechnologist's work, the doctor in charge of the laboratory. Will you be getting these out this afternoon? Yes, I will. Good. Hey, don't you know what time it is? What time? It's time for coffee. Come on. Okay, I'll be right with you. This world in which the cytotechnologist works isn't a small world all by itself. Usually, it's part of a larger laboratory where the shop talk is shared with other laboratory people. Medical technologists, they're called. 
Have you seen Alice since she got back? Yes, yeah, she looks wonderful, doesn't she? I hear she had a great time. Excuse me, Helen. You have an emergency blood count in 201. Okay, uh, I'll be right there. Sometimes the laboratory is in a hospital. Sometimes the private office of a pathologist. Often in smaller laboratories, the cytotechnologist will do other things, such as Helen's work in blood analysis. Good morning. Good morning. You're Mr. Elliot, are you? Yes, I am. Dr. Miller has asked us to take a little blood laboratory test. Now, I'm just going to prick your finger. Another one of the laboratory activities that a cytotechnologist may share is that of making tissue sections of a biopsy. This is another way that the pathologist examines cells. A small piece of tissue that the doctor wants to have examined is removed from a patient. It is embedded in a cube of paraffin so that it can be put in this machine and sliced into extremely thin sections. The fragile wisps of tissue are floated in a bath of warm water, which flattens them out so that one can be caught on a slide. Like exfoliated cells, these are stained so they can be studied. Say, Dave, do you have the tissue sections from a Gertrude Willoughby yet? Willoughby? Yeah, that was one I did yesterday. Do you have the pathologist's report? I was pretty sure there were cancer cells in the slide we had from her, and I'm curious to see if I was right. Mm, cancer. You were right. Can I take a look at it? Here are normal cells. And next to them, cancer. Cells in a tissue section can give even more information than exfoliated cells. So whenever a possible cancer is found in a slide prepared by a cytotechnologist, a section of tissue is taken from the patient to make sure of the diagnosis. Though Betty Robbins specializes in cytotechnology, there are still other jobs that a cytotechnologist may do besides blood analysis and work with tissue sections. It will depend on the laboratory and on the person's training. Classes in cytotechnology are held in qualified hospitals. The normal variant. First of all, there are several sites from which exfoliated cells can come. Some of these sites include the trachea, the peripheral bronchi, and the alveoli. Can you suggest any other places from which these exfoliated cells could come? The mouth? Yes. The nose? Sure. Uh, the esophagus? A person may train for medical technology, or cytotechnology, or both. In any case, this is work for those who are interested in science and have gotten a good scientific background at college. For people like Betty, who have learned the fascination of the world of science, this is a satisfying occupation. Helen Tyne, normal. Oscar Dufault, normal. D. L. Richardson, normal. Edna Morse, Edna Morse, abnormal. Here are today's slides, Doctor. Good. Ed and the Mars, hmm? One of Derpy's patients. These are hers right here. I've checked the ones I thought were abnormal. All right. Let's have a look. You were right. They are abnormal. 
I would say almost certainly cancer. Is there anything else, Doctor? No, thanks. I'll get a report to Duffy. Another day, perhaps another life saved. Edna Morris, whoever you are. Dr. Baker on the phone. Hello, Al. Edna Morris, really? There just wasn't a sign of anything. From the appearance of the cells, I'd say there's a good possibility you've turned up an early case here. Well, that's something. All right, many thanks for the call. We'll get a biopsy right away to confirm it. Now, do you understand? I want to make that absolutely clear. Though it is cancer, we've caught it at the beginning. You're sure? You're one of the fortunate ones, Mrs. Morris. At this stage, we can be reasonably sure that we can cure it completely. Ready to go? All ready. Have a good day today? Mm-hmm. Good day. <laughs> <laughs>